On The Gary Bisbee Show, hear practical lessons from today's healthcare insiders. We'll uncover stories about their challenges, paths to success, and the skills that they've developed, as together, we'll explore how the healthcare economy is transforming. Dr. Don Rucker was a uniquely qualified director of the Office of National Coordinator, known as ONC. He trained and practiced at the intersection of medicine and information technology over the last 30 years. We held our conversation in February 2021, shortly after he left office and went on a well-deserved skiing holiday. As Herbert Hoover promised, quote, a chicken for every pot, end quote, in the 1928 presidential campaign, the High Tech Act of 2009 financed an EHR in every hospital and most doctor's offices. The $35 billion spent from 2010 to 2020 went a long way toward digitizing medicine and creating the need for standards and regulations addressed by ONC. What did Don speak about during our free-flowing conversation? Let's start with patients' control of their health information, interoperability, transparency, information blocking, and data exchange between providers and insurers. As Don said, quote, where consumers have control of their information, interoperability is a given. Think banking and airlines. In healthcare, we have to fight for that, and we did, end quote. All in all, I give Dr. Don Rucker high marks for accomplishments during his four years in office and his commitment to a bipartisan approach. He deserved his skiing vacation. Don holds a BA from Harvard, an MD from the University of Pennsylvania, and an MBA and MA from Stanford. Good afternoon, Don, and welcome. Uh, thank you, Gary. Always a pleasure. This is our first recording together. We've done once or twice in-person meetings, so uh, let's see how this one works. But at any event, why don't we start at the beginning, just briefly get a little feel, Don, for you. What was life like growing up? Grew up with um, in a family um, in New Jersey with immigrant parents. So, you know, that sort of always colors the experience. Um, father was from Germany, mother was from Estonia. So, you know, um, I guess today that doesn't count as multicultural, but, you know, for New Jersey in the 60s, um, it certainly was. Um, and, um, you know, had a, um, my dad was a physicist. Um, and so, you know, we sort of came from a, science, math kind of, um, you know, background assumption. Where did your interest in medicine come from, Don? You know, I think a lot of it was, frankly, to be honest, you know, you know, well, first I wanted to be a pilot, then I got glasses, and my mother was pleased that, that I got glasses so I couldn't be a pilot. Um, that was the first plan. Um, and so I said, okay, you can't be a pilot. I don't think that's actually true, but what did I know? Um, and, um, you know, then, you know, when I was an undergraduate trying to figure out how to push, you know, whatever I could understand in science, um, I, um, actually met the requirements to major in both chemistry and physics, um, as an undergrad. So, um, you know, you can imagine a lot of, a lot of very sort of math oriented types of things. Um, you know, I had to be a realistic, I, you know, knew I wasn't going to be smart enough to be a world-class physicist or chemist. Um, but, you know, I thought the, the medical stuff I could do. Um, and so, um, and, you know, that was sort of natural. I actually toyed with the idea, which was very unpopular in the 70s of going into business, you know, going to business school and doing something there. Uh, family background had no business sense discussion ever, never came up at the dinner table kind of thing. Um, but, you know, at any rate, I went to medicine, uh, med school, and then honestly, within a year, um, pretty much realized um, that American medicine was um, a very problematic activity, um, both from, you know, a business, right, sort of an allocation of goods. I had an interest in public policy, even in college, and did a lot of, you know, reading and economics and things. So both from an economic and frankly, from a patient customer service, you know, performance of care type of view. Um, and at that point, Penn, um, as you may remember, is a wonderful place to explore 
the intersection of healthcare, economics, policy. Um, and at that point, I was sort of full bore trying to figure out, you know, I thought, well, do I just get out of this thing? And I said, you know, there's probably way more things to impact here than any other sector of the economy. Um, so let me use the medicine as a background to do that. And then it really went into exploring what could be done, what, you know, or what I could add. And where did the uh, interest in information technology and informatics come from? So that was a little bit of a circuitous route to be truthful. Um, when I went to college, right? So the right before college, my dad, who, as I mentioned, was a physicist, told me there are two things he didn't want me to do. And, you know, and I'm thinking sex, drugs, and rock and roll is three things. So out of that, um, you know. Which are you going to give up, right? You know, which, what, what are the two things? And he said um, he didn't want me to do anything in computer programming or statistics, which was like a total what? Um, since my dad done some programming, was a physicist. Um, and his advice, which, you know, maybe I'm rebelling against for the rest of my life, though we had a very good relationship. Um, he said, um, computer programming, you learn when you need it. Um, I think that's true of programming. I don't think that's true of computer science, um, which you really need to understand data. Um, so, I, but, you know, again, different opinions, different era. Um, and statistics, he sort of made the point that has a certain truth to it, which is if you need to show statistics for something, it's probably not true. Now, um, my dad designed explosives for a career. Um, so he had a pretty high standard for what worked. Um, there's not a lot of tolerance and failure in explosives. So, um, you know, where he was coming from, those were good. Um, so I didn't do any computer classes. There was only really one computer class really or two back in, you know, when I started Harvard in 73. Now that didn't bother two of my college classmates, one of whom I knew a little bit, um, Steve Ballmer and Bill Gates, who found plenty of stuff to do in computing, but I didn't get there. Um, and I didn't, you know, would have loved to have met Gates, never did. Um, but when I got to med school, I thought I was very heavily influenced by, um, so I was doing the exploring, heavily influenced by John Eisenberg, whom some of your audience may know. John um, was eventually the head of what's now ARC, um, did many, many things in healthcare um, policy, was an absolutely charismatic person um, and was um, when in my third year in med school was his first year as a faculty member. And he had sort of a spectacular rise combining an MBA and a residency. And he was very charismatic. And there were a couple of us um, that he got hooked on decision trees and decision analysis. And so I pursued that with John, did a, uh, you know, did a, one, a custom rotation with him did a research project with him. We never had enough data to actually get anything published, but um, you know, worked directly with John because um, I was just so fascinated by it. And after med school and residency at UCSD was thinking, you know, I'm gonna do something around that. Um, you know, residency was sort of a wake up call for me and as with probably many docs, maybe all docs. Um, and I realized as I was going through residency, the issue was not want of decision trees, um, you know, wish that it were. The issue was basically there was no data to even do a decision tree. So now we're talking early 80s. Um, and at that point, you sort of figure out, OK, I've sort of wanted to change things. Um, clearly, you know, so 81, the Apple II had been out, um, the PC had come out. The Mac was still a couple of years, you know, was 84. And, you know, it was clear that, you know, having a computerization approach to this is what was going to be needed. You know, that was abundantly clear. When you're, you know, in your late twenties, finishing a residency and trying to figure out how the hell am I gonna learn computer science? That part wasn't clear, <laughs> um, right? You know, a lot of some costs seemingly at that point in one's career. 
Um, and um, so that part wasn't really at all clear to me. And um, the tail end of residency was basically amongst, you know, besides being a resident was trying to figure that out. I was just honestly lucky as hell to, um, you know, and I, I wrote letters to people on a typewriter, mind you, this was, you know, before word processing really, on, on a typewriter describing what I wanted to do. And just through absolute fortuitousness, um, Hal Sox, who was at the time, the head of uh, general medicine at Stanford said, oh, there's this young faculty member across the hall named Ted Shortliff, who's starting a program in medical computing. You ought to write to him. Um, so get the typewriter out again, dear Professor Shortliff, or I think it was assistant professor back in the day, um, you know, interested in this. So I was lucky enough to get into that um, with the proviso that since I'd never taken a computer class and it's a little bit hard to do computer science as a grad student without any undergrad, that amongst other things, which I was very pleased to do, that I would do the um, entire undergraduate Stanford CS curriculum, which I did other than compilers. Um, that was the hardest academic stuff I've ever done, probably maybe some of the physics things. Um, and then um, was also interested in the business school stuff and uh, was um, lucky enough to get into the Stanford MBA program. Um, so yeah, um, that's how I <laughs> decided to, um, to uh, approach, um, you know, the business of data and healthcare. You know, those were the tools that I um, decided to try to arm myself with. Well, it's a fascinating background. And the fact that you came to data really as the core of it uh, speaks a lot for your ability to cut through a lot of what's going on today and get to the to the main point. Why don't we fast forward through your time at Siemens and get right to ONC for our listeners or viewers who may not be familiar. Could you describe the Office of National Coordinator for us, Don, please? Sure, Gary. Um, the Office of National Coordinator is what in GovSpeak, um, which you become sort of a bit of an expert at, try to use as few neurons on that as possible, but um, uh, is a staff agency. So one of the smaller agencies within the Department of Health and Human Services. So technically, you know, you report to the cabinet secretary, Alex Azar, um, in my case. Um, you know, the operating agencies in HHS are the ones that are household words, you know, CMS, NIH, CDC, um, smaller one, ARC, FDA. Um, and um, was started by President Bush in 2004, really to encourage medical records. So David Brailler was the first uh, national coordinator, has sort of probably the longest title outside of anything in the Defense Department. Um, you know, National Coordinator for Health Information Technology in the office of the National Coordinator for <laughs> Health Information Technology. Um, everybody sort of shortened it to ONC for sanity. Merci sake. Mercifully. Yeah, mercifully. Um, and again, pronounced ONC as opposed to ONC. Um, I was told, you know, the first day I got there. The agency that is involved in the certification of electronic health records through the High Tech Act um, and then CMS payment things tied to use of certified electronic health records. It's also more broadly, as you could imagine from the title, geared to the encouragement of the infrastructure in health information technology. So a lot of work focusing on supporting standards organization, convening around standards, getting buy-in around standards, doing that nationally, internationally. Um, so I think um, if you look at the, the core things, obviously we had a huge regulatory role as well with the Cures Act, but if you look at the core ongoing activities, they're the encouragement of information technology through modern data standards, um, in many ways, large and small, and then um, the certification of electronic health records to um, encourage slash quasi-mandate, you know, slash mandate uh, the use of those standards. As director, you always wonder uh, from the outside looking in what degrees of freedom you have uh, to set strategy, change direction and whatnot. How would you define the role of director, Don? Yeah, uh, that was um, 
you know, an open question to me, <laughs> you know, when I got there, I mean, you, you hit, hit, the, hit it spot on, which is, I mean, I obviously had a bunch of ideas um, on what I think need to be done next around standards and interoperability. Um, and, you know, and that's a complicated thing because it's as much a volitional thing around incentives, right? As opposed to just, you know, bits and bytes and, and um, you know, technical standards. So I had obviously having spent 30 years in the field, uh, you know, a pretty good idea of things that could be done or should be done. Um, I did not, truth be told, appreciate um, the impact of the 21st Century Cures Act had a big title four in that was entirely on mandating interoperability. I thought I was going to have to do this with, you know, sort of a much thinner set of, if you will, authorities um, to, um, I did not, you know, I had like most folks um, in the space thought of the Cures Act as an FDA reform document and, you know, the data around clinical trials and FDA decision-making, that's 90% or 95% of the text in the act. I did not realize um, that in that, again, this was just, you know, past, um, shortly before I got there, it was passed almost unanimously December of 2016. So that was, you know, not known to me that there was not only were there interoperability provisions in there, but with uh, great kudos, no doubt to the technical assistance provided by my predecessors, uh, Karen DeSalvo and Vindel Washington and um, in the Obama administration working with Congress on both sides that the language was extraordinarily empowering um, and really said there shall be standardized APIs. It was framed as APIs, application programming interfaces without special effort, and there shall not be information blocking. Those are extraordinarily powerful mandates to do the right thing in interoperability. So um, at that point, you know, it was just the huge work to take what were a couple sentences, clear directives from Congress, bipartisan, but take those sentences, it was actually about 40 pages when you get through all, all the, the, the things, and make that into something that made sense for the country. Well, what kind of progress were you able to make then? Well, you know, maybe I'm not the right judge of that, but in my view, huge. We. Um, put out a um, interoperability rule. Um, and so that um, includes a lot of things administratively, right? So because all of these federal rules are done under um, notice of public comment rulemaking and PRM. So um, with vast dialogue from stakeholders, um, I had easily 200 meetings with stakeholders. I met with everybody who wanted to meet with, with it. You know, my policy was an open door policy at ONC um, and um, lots of public speaking. I, I don't know exactly the count, but um, you know, I think it's something 100, 200, 150 um, outside speaking events. I think maybe even one or two for, for uh, you know, uh, on, on your turf. Um, and, um, you know, you have to really gain, you know, you have to really build a consensus, ed educate, get people pumped about the stuff. Um, we did all of that. Um, I think we have put in the absolute best on some of the, the critical lifts. So, you know, um, within, you know, the legal framework we have in the United States in terms of protecting privacy, security. Um, one of the things that's maybe not as obvious to your audience, um, the there shall not be information blocking, which requires a lot more definition, right? What is information blocking? Um, that, um, and ONC was involved, it was in the quote, exceptions to information blocking as a practical matter, since, um, you know, vendors could say, and, and, you know, have said in the past, we're just not gonna share, right? Just period. Um, and, um, you know, then you have the delicate balancing act, you know, solving, what in physics is an unsolved problem, which is the three body problem. Um, and so, right, the three bodies are um, two bodies covered by um, the information blocking provisions, 
who are EMR vendors and providers, but, and then patients. So just the economics of it to play out and to, to um, solve and rulemaking, solve is a big word, but you know, to, to address the rulemaking, patients should get their data for free. This is just part of the practice of modern medicine. Um, the federal government, state governments regulate the provision of medical care all the time in thousands of ways, large and small. And, you know, patients should just have their data. This is sort of literally a human right, I believe, um, you, know, to, you know, to have your data. Okay, that's fine. But, you know, and, you know, it's quote free. Now, of course, it's not free because you paid for the care. It's embedded in the cost of care. But at the margin, it's quote free. Um, and obviously the vendors on their side need to have a return on investment. They need to have incentives to invest. They need to have incentives to innovate, which leaves the providers who typically have bought EHRs that they can't just switch out because of the switching costs at the mercy, if you will, of their EHR vendor, their incumbent vendors on the one hand, and then having to provide something new on the other. Um, and so we came up with sort of provisions on sort of costs reasonably allowed that um, really I think are very pro-public, you know, in giving vendors, you know, reasonable returns. Obviously there are all kinds of issues on how you define that and think about that just from a, a philosophic point of view, frankly, as much as anything else, but yet protect providers so that they can operationally do this. Um, and you know, provide patients with secure application programming interface endpoints that they can you know point their smartphones at. Um, it you know, when done right, is is um, I th and, and we've already seen this from Apple Health Kit, um, is a pretty low friction activity, right? It's just providing a server endpoint to the database, um, you know, hooked up to your EHR. So this is not an ongoing maintenance. It's not a human intervention. We want to make this seamless, modern instantaneous, um, and that's what we've done in the rulemaking. And I think we have, you know, at this stage, um, you know, buy-in from all of the parties. Obviously there was a lot of commotion about some of this that had to be worked through, as you were probably aware. It seems like this role is among other things, a negotiator. <laughs> you talked about the various parties. How much of your time was actually spent negotiating some point of uh, consensus? Oh, depending on how you count, probably most of it. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that's different than any other management role, truth be told. Um, you know, management in the government's a little bit different than managing a corporate thing, um, right? Because, you know, in a corporate environment, there's a little bit of a chain of command. Um, never quite as much as you think. I mean, if you think you really have a chain of command, um, you're probably in a somewhat unique thing um, or not long for the world where you're working. Um, it's been my observation over the decades, but um, the in government, you know, obviously the civil service employees are in a funny kind of way, free agents. Now, ONC is wonderful. It's a new agency. People are very mission driven. So that's not an issue, but I think in other government agencies, it's my understanding that that has been. Um, and then you, um, you know, it's an education thing really and, and getting all of the folks involved and, you know, sharing with them what other folks needs are. Um, we did, you know, part of the outreach is, you know, and the public speaking is really getting people to um, think about you know, I, I think in pretty much every presentation I did or talk, um, I, I th I'm trying to think now, but you know, there was, you know, parts of it that were letting everybody know what other people's needs were, right? So yeah, I know you want this, but you know, don't forget, you know, that those folks may want something else or will want something else. Don, let's let's turn to a discussion we had briefly before, and that is the role of big data, uh, particularly at that interface between the providers and the payers. And we can talk, you know, on down the line here about the personalization aspect of that, because that'll bounce up against it too. But 
What about this big data and the role it's going to play in the provider world and the provider payer interface? Yeah, you know, we, we've just talked about the, you know, the substrate for getting the app economy into healthcare, which um, will no doubt be transformative in the same way that the app economy has transformed, you know, much of the rest of our lives, whether it's travel, banking, entertainment, sports, retail, all of those things. Um, that will happen in healthcare. The arbitrage opportunities are too large. The other thing that we focused on with these APIs, we heard a lot of um, complaints, interestingly enough, that uh, providers weren't able to get at their own data, interestingly enough. Um, and, you know, that's from a computing standpoint and the history of EHRs, it's sort of understandable, you know, these technologies have, you know, histories and trajectories. But um, part of what we did um, along with, you know, is have fire so fast healthcare interoperability resources. So these are the modern API class that um, uses, you know, RESTful and JSON and, and modern um, internet techniques to actually have um, a, what, I, what we called, I probably should have named it something else, but talking with Ken Mandel and Boston Children's, you know, we were talking about, and I called it, oh yeah, like a bulk API for bulk data. I was shocked to find out that all the prior work was for just one record at a time, which to me as a database person is like, what? You have a query that only returns one record? I mean, this was so unfathomably primitive to me that I couldn't even imagine it, it sort of happening. Um, and so then the question was what to do to get that in as well. Um, and that obviously, um, you know, so working with folks, Ken Mandel, huge leadership here, um, a lot of other folks, Josh Mandel and at, at um, you know, um, at, at um, Microsoft now and HL7, we got through the bulk fire API. So it's part of version four of the HL7 fire standard. And we put it in as a requirement in, in the records that will, um, allow access to populations of patient data. Now to be very clear, because I know the next question in people's mind is what they're just gonna let me rummage around for data and EHRs on thousands of patients? Um, no. So the individual right of access to, you know, you put your smartphone at your provider's endpoint using the password you have for your portal, which is how that works under something called OAuth2, a security protocol that is under your individual HIPAA right of access. Most data that's moved in healthcare is actually moved for specific purposes of treatment payment operations by um, this concept of covered entities, so providers for the most part, and um, payers, um, and then third parties who are quote business associates. Those are all terms of art in the land of HIPAA. But the bottom line for the audience generally is any transmission of this data is a signed, written, accountable contract between people who have a clearly legally defined role to this individually identified data. So as happens now, it's just making it more efficient. That's the underpinning, the bulk fire API. So that's the tech. So what does that mean? Well, I think everybody has seen TV, uh, news clips, read some articles, but you know, much of our world is fueled by big data. If you have used Google or Amazon, which I'm positive is 100% of your audience, um, I'm not even sure you could get to this without you know, you know, Google or, or search tool. Um, you have been behind the scenes, um, all kinds of big data tools have been worked on to present that. And you know, big data, volume, variety, velocity in healthcare, don't forget right now, we do not have great ways of paying for healthcare. And we certainly, we've been on this 20 year search for value in healthcare um, since circa 2000. Um, and the things we've come up with are very narrow and really don't bear any relationship to what we want as consumers um, and value for the dollar. I mean, that's just 
you know, they were the best that it was at the time. But if you look at the things we've put in as proxies for value, whether these very narrow, heavily politicized quality measures or, you know, provider and patient burdens like prior authorization or this, you know, cumbersome ginned up, um, uh, you know, fake for want of a better word documentation, these e &M things, none of these things really are good. Um, and so we need, you know, we're screaming for new ways to analyze what we're getting. If you're a payer in healthcare today, it's worth pondering. So the payers who buy care on our behalf, today they only have four ways of deciding what to buy on our behalf. And none of them are particularly good, right? So they can go on these narrow quality measures. Um, it's like you're going to buy a car based on one single feature, right? The color of the rear seat or something, you know. I mean, that's, uh, you know, they can go on reputation. You know, it's Hopkins, Mayo, you know, pick your, pick your folks. They can go on, you know, the sort of narrow network concept. These are the cheapest people and they're licensed. So we're gonna do them, use them. Or they can go what in many cases, um, are the you know oligopoly delivery systems that have sprung up throughout the country and your audience knows who they are. Um, and they, you know, the trick there is, as we know, is to become large enough that you have to be a network. And then you go from being a price um, taker for employers and payers to a price setter. Well, none of those four ways of paying for healthcare is anything that we as consumers want, which is why healthcare takes up 20% of the GDP. With big data, you know, with these APIs, for the first time ever, you're gonna have robust computational ways. Again, they both have to agree, you know, the payer and the provider have to agree, but for the first time ever, you're gonna have the opportunity to have true, broadly encompassing, rich, uh, computation around value and performance. It's going to revolutionize healthcare. Um, and it's part of what we did in the administration on transparency, not just on price, but also on the product. So um, I think it is the modern way the rest of the world works. Um, it's a bit of a sleeper thing. I don't think people quite have put all these things together um, from a you know provider system point of view. I don't think people quite realize how this will very likely play out. I think you're right on that. What's the time frame for our listeners? So over the next three years, five years, 10 years, when will this really begin to make an impact? So the API requirement for both the, the core data for interoperability, which is that standard heavily formatted data, the Cures Act requires all data. That's going to be end of December 23. But the, the core data, which is formatted data, so med list, problem list, allergies, um, is ended December 22, and the same for the fire, the bulk fire APIs. Um, so, you know, these things have a cycle time, you know, you have contracting time, you have thinking time, you have product time. So I, I would say that time frame plays out and, um, you know, my guess would be in four or five years. Yeah, well, that's very interesting. We'll look for that for sure that's gonna have a major impact on everybody. Would you talk for a moment about the personal side, the personalization, the consumer, what's the benefit to the consumer of having uh, the new data and, and data that's more accessible? You know, the sort of prior ONC rulemaking, um, you know, required portals. Um, and that was really the best technology. I mean, now we're only going back a couple of years, but that was the best technology available. But we know today in this sort of smartphone world that um, the, um, you know, the thing that consumers want is sort of a little bit of a goofy word called agency. Consumers want power. They don't want to have the data sitting somewhere else under somebody else's control um, they want the data on their platform, if you will, their smartphone with apps of their choice so they can analyze or their apps can provide them whatever data informed services they want. There, I think there'll be all kinds of entrepreneurial stuff here. It'll 
probably start with just smarter EHRs, you know, EHR proxies, but, um, you know, and for folks with major illnesses, it'll be very disease specific things. There'll be recommendations. I think um, all of these things will be infused with price transparency um, on some level sooner or later, um, alternatives and care. Um, the phones, of course, are heavily instrumented. So I think it will also be the medium for richer, you know, patient generated data, telemetry monitors, um, you know, smart watch type of data. Um, and it will be with all these internet of things, this will be sort of the central platform to aggregate all of that. And it will allow healthcare to be continuous with us as opposed to just going to the doctor visit every three months, six month year, what, what your situation is. I think it'll make healthcare a more continuous, integrated, seamless, under the covers activities, which should have a huge impact on prevention, right? Because as, as we know, maybe not modulo COVID, but ultimately even in the year of COVID, and even for the people who nominally died of COVID, most of that was underlying chronic illness um, that was really um, at the root of it. And in a world where we have that, um, you know, it'll, it'll, I think human creativity will be simply awesome here. I, I don't, you know, I hope I live long enough to see it all, but, um, you know, I think creativity will be just stunning here. Yeah, I agree with that. I think you will live long enough because I think it's coming and has been for some time, as you know. Uh, back to the agency, um, Mickey Tripathi is your, uh, is following you as a national coordinator. What advice would you have for Mickey? I think there's a bipartisan, you know, I've had a discussion with Mickey about some of the operational issues and stuff, uh, you know, which, you know, we'll just leave there. Very cordial discussion. Um, you know, I, I think the beauty of this has been um, that it's been a remarkably bipartisan activity. I mean, when you, the things we just talked about, including a lot of the stuff we've done with health information exchanges and COVID and public health data and pro-competitive, pro-social determinative health as a platform, all of that has been bipartisan. And almost essentially everything I worked on was started by the prior administration. So I think there's a fair amount of continuity here. Um, you know, obviously um, emphasis may change, times will change, um, situations will change, but um, I, I think there's sort of a lot of consensus and um, obviously um, all of these things were done with a whole team of people, you know, all of whom are still there, um, you know, working on things and, you know, provided input before and will, you know, provide rich input as they have in the past. Don, this has been a terrific, interview, we need more time because you've got such in depth knowledge and many of these issues are so critical to healthcare. But let me wrap up if I could with the question. It will seem as an a bit of an odd question. But if you were to think about your legacy, and you've got a long way to go. So you probably don't think about that. What would you want your legacy to be at this point? I have spent my career, as, as we've just discussed, <laughs> at probably too great a length, um, you know, trying to infuse healthcare, you know, medicine and healthcare more broadly with modern data, modern approaches, maximize the information for science, um, and get people as empowered to be um, in charge of their lives and their bodies. Um, and, um, you know, many, many, many people have played a part in that. And, um, you know, I've, I've um, been pleased to have an opportunity to, to work with all those folks in, in advancing that. Don, thanks so much for being with us. We hope you'll come back and visit again and take a couple of days off, will you, after, <laughs> after all that time with ONC? Appreciate it. Thank you, Gary. Yeah.